Today on Applied Science, I'm going to show you how to build a pump in which the only moving part is the liquid itself, and it functions as a flow sensor, and it doesn't use any magnets. So until I said that last part, you may have recalled the movie The Hunt for Red October, in which there's this um, fictional sounding but actually quite realistic thing called the magnetohydrodynamic drive, which is a long name for something that's actually fairly simple. Uh, you know that if you pass a current through a wire that's in a magnetic field, the wire is going to move because the magnetic field produced by the current flow interacts with the stationary magnetic field. So in a magnetohydrodynamic drive, uh, if you have a conductive liquid and we pass some currents through it and there's a magnetic field going on, there will be a reaction force. We imagine that the liquid is actually forming a wire and it's getting pushed out of the magnetic field and then more water or conductive liquid flows in. You might also know that you can move a stream of water with an electrostatic field and no magnets just by charging up a plastic comb or a piece of PVC pipe and holding it near a stream of water. Now it's not quite fair to call this a pump because the thing that's actually doing the work is my hand bringing the plastic pipe closer to the water stream. To qualify as sort of a real pump, it would have to run continuously by itself and have an energy source coming in and changing the uh, pressure and flow of the water. So today I'm going to show you an electroosmotic pump, which I think is a more obscure and maybe more interesting uh, way to play with electric fields and water. So quickly, we've got two glass uh, cylinders here. They're actually pipettes. And the water column joins into water on this side and this column joins into water on this side. And when I say side, the two sides are divided by a glass frit filter. So this is basically just glass particles packed together and then sintered together to make this um, hard disk, which is porous. And then on either side of the disk, there is a stainless steel wire mesh screen, which is connected to a stainless steel rod. And the rod exits the uh, water chamber so that I can connect up to it electrically. Very simple setup. And the fluid is just pure uh, deionized distilled water. It's as pure as I can get it. And then we've got our high voltage power supply here and a current meter to monitor how much current is going through the circuit. Pretty straightforward. So let's turn it on. We've got about 200 volts selected. And as soon as I throw the switch, keep your eye on the water levels in the two columns there. We'll turn on. And yeah, it's, it's pumping water quite fast actually. We're drawing about three milliamps and we're running at 200 volts DC. And you can see that it's actually overflowing the top here. Now, something interesting happens if I put my finger on the end of it. Watch what happens to the current. As you can see here, now we're down to 1.6, 1.5 milliamps. And you can see on the graph here the history of what's happened. And if I remove my finger, current starts to increase again. Let's see that effect on current again. Uh, this time I'm going to change the uh, time scale here so that it's maybe a little bit easier to see. So we'll go to one second so that we can see the graph passing more quickly. And I also added more water to both sides. And when I switch on, I'm going to alternately plug and unplug this and then also add more water to the other side to try to keep the levels about the same. So um, switch on here, 200 volts. You can see it's coming out and uh, we'll let this thing try to stabilize. And as it's going, I'm going to be adding more water to that side to try to keep it equal. So we've got maybe 1.4 milliamps. And if I plug this up, it's going down. And if I unplug it, it's heading back again. So we're getting a swing of maybe about half a milliamp um, versus plugged flow versus unplugged flow. So it's about 0.9. And if I let this go, pretty uh, obvious change there. So it's pretty cool that we have a pumping device. Let me turn this off. Pretty cool that we have a pumping device that moves water with just an electric field, no magnets, pure water that's non-conductive, or at least as close to non-conductive as water gets. And then also it functions as a flow sensor so that if we adjust how much water is allowed to flow through it, we can read that out with the current. As you might have guessed, the direction of the water flow can be controlled by the electrical polarity. So if we do 200 volts in this direction, negative on this side, you can see the water column is rising on the right. And if I turn this off, there's a switch on the back of this power supply that flips the polarity. 
So now if we turn on, the water is pumping the other way. Uh, this, the right side's going down, the left side's going up. Uh, one thing that you'll notice is when I switch this off and there's no uh, electrical field across here, the water is very, very slowly returning back to the equilibrium point. And the reason for that is that this porous glass filter is really restrictive to flow. In fact, it holds water against gravity even. You can fill this little beaker up and water does not flow through uh, because it's just such a small hole size. Just to give you an idea of what kind of pressures this setup is capable of producing, I've plugged this side up so that there's no way the syringe can back out on its own. And then I've connected a pressure gauge up, not with a super solid connection here, but good enough for today's purposes. And we're gonna pump in this direction. So the pressure gauge will show uh, positive pressure here. So we'll switch on. And um, as we saw before, we'll notice that the, the, the current will actually taper off as this thing compresses the airspace that's up here. And eventually it will reach an, an equilibrium point similar to having my finger on the top here. So we know when the current levels off, there's no more flow going through and the pressure reading will be valid. So it's a little bit above where it was. It's maybe about three quarters of a PSI. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. What would, be, what would happen if we measured the current flowing through this without the high voltage supply and then forced some water through it? Let's try it. So I will disconnect here and here and connect this up here. So now the high voltage supply is completely disconnected and we're measuring just the current. And I'm going to change the range to be 100 microamps. Okay, so the current is drifting a little bit, but it's more or less stable at about seven point something microamps. And that's probably due to a slight amount of electrochemical action in there. So I'm gonna cap this end and then squeeze the syringe here to force water uh, in one direction through here. And as we can see, there's a pretty big current change. And if I pull it back the other way, there's a change back the other way. So this was sort of one flow. If I try to keep it constant, it'll be below this baseline and water is flowing through the device. Now if I switch and go back the other way, we can actually monitor the flow of water through the device very, very accurately. In fact, I'm just, you can actually follow the water column here to see what the pressure is. And the signal that we're reading out is most likely due to the flow through this uh, electroosmotic system. Pretty cool. Here's a drawing of what's happening inside the electroosmotic pump. We've got both water columns here and they're joined together and then separated at the bottom with this fritted glass filter. And on either side of the fritted filter, we have our electrodes. So the thing to know here, the, the real key that's driving this whole thing is something weird that happens when we put water next to glass. And this is true for plain old pure water next to plain old pure glass regardless of any electric fields going on or any weird business. If you just put water and glass together, this is what happens. The glass is attracted to the OH part of H2O and actually separates the water slightly so that the H plus is free to move, but the OH is actually stuck to the surface. Now, normally you don't really notice anything happening when you're just you know, play, playing with water and glass or even doing a chemical reaction because this distance over which this effect is happening is really short. So the surface of the glass uh, causes this slight separation of the water, but it's really only happening within a very, very narrow distance of the wall. But it does happen. And then if we put an external electronic or electrical field on here, uh, the fact that we've got these free H pluses moving means that they are now affected by this field. So if we have positive here and negative here, and the uh, negative part of water is basically stuck to the wall that leaves these positives free to move and they will in fact be moving toward the right in this diagram because they're positively charged and the electrodes um, are you know opposites attract basically. The system can run indefinitely because the water is basically discharged out this side and then more water flows in 
and the glass will cause the separation with the new water that flows in and the old water that flows out, the two uh, parts recombine and everything is fine. So if you look at the whole system, or at least the glass water system um, as a whole, there's no net charge because everything is balanced. It just happens to be that near the wall, there's this charge separation. So as you might have guessed, this happens with more materials than just glass and water. Uh, in fact, it happens with most materials. Well, I shouldn't say most, but more than you might think. Uh, I know that it also works with plastic membranes. Track etched membranes will do it with water. Um, you can also use acetonitrile instead of water. That works just fine too. The things that won't work are uh, fluids that can't be separated like this. So nonpolar things like oils or uh, hydrocarbon type liquids and stuff probably won't work. Um, but alcohol would probably work because it has, it's a polar molecule and you can probably cause this uh, splitting to happen. Another interesting thing is adding something to the water that will make it more conductive. And I'll put links to all the papers uh, in the description. But at first you might think that this is a bad idea because ideally if the water was completely non-conductive, which it isn't by the way, but let's just say we had a, a fluid that was 100% not conductive, that would be great because we actually don't want any current to flow between these electrodes. Um, as it turns out though, having some amount of um, ionizable stuff in your uh, solution actually helps this process out. So in one of the papers, they figured out that adding um, ammonium hydroxide to the solution up to a point increased the efficiency of the pump. Um, there's a lot of sort of complicated math that they like to throw in there because it's an academic paper, but it is actually an interesting optimization problem. Like you basically don't want a lot of current to flow. Obviously, if we dumped in like a ton of salt and we put our 200 volts across here, you know, an amp is going to flow and it's going to be terrible efficiency. Most of the power is going to be going into electrolysis. We don't want a current to flow between these two electrodes, uh, causing a chemical reaction and splitting up other stuff in the solution. Uh, but if there's a very small amount of conductive stuff, either salt or sodium hydroxide or ammonium hydroxide or anything, um, in a way that's good because it makes this layer thicker. The idea is that uh, if you add more ions to the solution, you can make this layer over which uh, this splitting is happening thicker. And if you have a thicker layer of, of, of charged stuff here, of separated stuff, then your pump is more efficient because it has more to grab onto. I should also point out the flow profile in this small passageway is very unusual. In almost all cases, um, if you have flow through a pipe, the flow profile is parabolic. And the reason for that is the, so if this is your pipe here, the stuff in contact with the wall, the fluid in contact with the wall can't move because it's in physical contact. And the stuff in the middle is furthest away from the wall. So it has the highest speed. So in pr pretty much all laminar pipe flow situations, you've got this parabolic flow profile. But something very weird happens with this electroosmotic flow. The stuff at the wall still can't move because it's in contact with the wall. However, the pump applies the most force to these charged particles the closer they are to the wall because there's more of this charge separation going on. So you end up with this really weird profile that looks kind of like this. So you have zero velocity at the wall, but then it goes to maximum velocity. But then at the center, there's the least amount of force applied to the water because it's far away. And so you end up with something like this, which is pretty bizarre. I think it's the only case that you would get such a thing. The system is also very tunable. So by changing the, uh, the thickness of this porous block, the diameter of the porous block, the size of the pores, the voltage, and the spacing of the electrodes, you can really custom tailor this pump to be almost anything you want. So in this case, uh, the um, porous part has a diameter of about 30, and the thickness is about 4.5 millimeters. And we were getting flow rates on the order of 20 milliliters per minute at about 200 volts at three milliamps. And you saw the pressures could be as high as about Oh, three PSI at maybe about 600 volts. And so this is pretty well in line with, um, with the academic literature. I should also point out that uh, the electrolysis is a completely unrelated sort of side reaction from the perspective of all this electroosmotic pumping. If we had a fluid that just didn't 
hap it just didn't do electrolysis, that'd be great. Um, there is a certain amount of current that's flowing between here, and the, the energy is going into um, splitting up those uh, molecules. So electrolysis means we're splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, and that's actually consuming most of the energy in this system. The thermodynamic efficiency of this electroosmotic pump is actually really terrible. It's on the order of about 0.1%. And so 99.9% .9 of the energy is going into splitting the water, even though it's still a, a relatively small amount of energy. And uh, it's only that other tiny bit that's going into moving the fluid. So compared to mechanical pumps, you know, you're not going to beat their efficiency. Uh, the reason that this electroosmotic pumping is cool is because you can scale it to be anything from, you know, microns big up to meters big, and it will accommodate all kinds of different flow and pressure situations. This terrible efficiency was shown in the experiments tonight because when we were pumping water through here forcefully and measuring the electrical current, we saw the numbers were very low, like on the order of five microamps. But when we're putting electrical current in and expecting flow out, we had to put in something like three milliamps. And so it's uh, showing sort of the order of magnitude of, of efficiency there. Another question is, why is this called electroosmosis? I don't think this is actually a great name for this phenomenon, but um, it sort of makes sense. Recall what osmosis is. If you've got this U-channel filled with some mild salt water and a membrane at the bottom through which the salt cannot pass, but water can, and then you add more salt to one side, what will happen is the water will actually be pumped across the membrane uh, so that the concentrations will attempt to be equalized by this process of osmosis. And it's actually very subtle how this works, right? It's not like the universe knows that there is an imbalance and it's trying to correct it. What's happening is there's random collisions happening with this membrane down here. And if a water molecule collides with it, there's a chance it will go through. But if a salt molecule collides with it, there's no chance it will go through. And if you run the simulation, it just happens to be that the water will eventually move across such that it equalizes out all these random chances. Um, it takes a little while to wrap your brain around it if you haven't thought about this, but it's kind of cool how random chance works. Like basically, uh, if, if you've got a ton of salt over here, the chance that it slams into the membrane is high because there's so much salt there, but it's never going to make it through the membrane, so it stays on that side. Hence, water will more likely flow into that area of higher concentration. So you've seen things like reverse osmosis filters, which apply a pressure gradient and force the, the clean water basically through the filter. I mean, one way of thinking of it is you've got this filter that's resistant to flow and you're basically forcing water through it. But another way to think of it is that dirty water would normally just sort of equalize itself out and by applying a pressure, you're uh, shifting the gradient of this osmotic balance. And so electroosmosis means we're using an electric field to apply this bias. Like instead of applying pressure and using that to separate out some sort of a solute in there. We're using the electric field to separate out these charged particles. And as we saw, uh, it's basically these, these positively charged things that are induced that way by the um, chemical reaction with the wall. One thing you might be wondering about is this fritted glass filter is not really a series of tubes. It's like a whole bunch of you know, random spaced uh, granules of glass all sort of jammed together. But keep in mind that the electric field is always very uniform. Uh, it's incredibly uniform. So even if the passageway is very tortuous, the flow profile, like the force or the, the, um, the, the force on these charged particles is always going in the right direction. So even if you have a really tortuous path, it ends up always flowing through in the right way. Your efficiency would probably be better if they were oriented all the same, uh, but it won't ever flow backwards or anything. It always pushes in the right direction. The filter that I'm using has particle size uh, between four and five and a half micron. Let's take this thing apart and I'll make comments on how I built this uh, as we go. So the um, columns are just regular old glass pipettes and I drilled a hole in here and just shoved an o-ring in and then put the pipette in and that made a pretty nice seal with that. And then there's a large clamp just holding it all together, which I'll undo, and this whole thing will probably spring apart. Hopefully, carefully, okay. 
and we can see one end here and um, all the channels are just connected together and then to keep the water from leaking out uh, with the electrode passed through, I have a piece of silicone tubing just shoved in there basically as kind of like an O-ring seal. Um, the stainless steel rod itself is just welding rod and I kind of really crudely spot welded it to this stainless steel mesh which I cut out with scissors. And here's the uh, glass frit membrane. And then I've also just got lure connections onto here so I can quickly plug a syringe in and pump water in or out of each side. To make these blocks, I, um, my preferred method is to use the fly cutter on the mill and then uh, quickly sand it with thousand grit, uh, round the corners, uh, apply a round over to the edges, and then uh, just a quick pass with white rouge. And that actually leaves almost a really nice optical finish. Not quite museum quality, but quite nice for what we're doing. Oh, and then I also have um, a piece of silicone just to seal to the glass. Okay, well, I hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.